Humanities Institute. And uh, it's our pleasure today to have Matt Bell here, who is the director of World Building, as well as uh, author of Appleseed, Refused to be Done, and many other works. Um, this is an opportunity to talk about some of Ted Chang's work, kind of frame it as we prepare for his visit, which he'll be giving a talk in Armstrong Hall across the way on February 15th. And then on February 16th at the Majestic Theater, we'll be showing Arrival, which is, of course, the film based off of one of his short stories. So uh, we um, are happy to have you here. And uh, kind of one of the reasons we're doing this and doing this in conjunction with world building, it's kind of the capacious thinking of uh, Ted Chang, the range of work he's doing. I was just reading something today. Uh, he wrote uh, something on AI for The New Yorker just a few months ago. AI is the new McKenzie. <laughs> and uh, so that kind of ability to range in his work. And I think uh, also if you've not had a chance to listen the Ezra Klein podcast mm -hmm. um, interview with Ted Chang is really excellent as a way of framing some of the work he does. So uh, thank you, Matt, for, uh, for leading cool. us off here. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, thanks to everybody who's here. Um, and thank you to those of us who are joining us online. I'm trying to remember which of the cameras is the Zoom one. This one is the Zoom one. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about Ted Chiang's Exhalation, which is uh, one of my favorite stories, one of my favorite writers, um, and excited to talk to him in February when he comes as well. Uh, one of the things I really appreciate about uh, Chang's work is his sort of ability to, to think deeply uh, and seriously over like a long period of time on, on sort of a thought problem in his head. Uh, and so I think I will just sort of dive in today and talk about maybe how I'm going to approach exhalation. Um, I'll say I think we have about an hour. I'll talk for 20, 30 minutes of it at most, and then we'll just open up to conversation and sort of go from there. Uh, for those of you who are online, I believe the HI staff has um, volunteered to ask your questions for you for when the time comes, so please have those ready. Um, and those of you in the room, obviously, I'll be able to see you so you can just do it here. Um, okay, let's uh, dive in. So just to give a little bit of background of my uh, reason for picking this story and my approach to it is one of the things that I'm sort of always interested in fiction as a, as a novelist myself is ways that fiction approaches sort of real world problems and the way it approaches complexity. I think uh, a lot of the ways we're taught to write fiction create these kind of simplified models of, of real life and I'm always interested in how we can sort of open that back up or make, make books that are sort of more complex. One of the things I really appreciate appreciate about Chang's work is the way that he works through sort of complex ideas or complex problems in narrative. Uh, for Exhalation specifically, one of the things I'm really attracted to about and we're talking about today is I think it's an example of depicting problem solving in fiction, which can be complicated. Uh, showing people thinking is not always the most interesting thing in the world on the page, and we want to, uh, but we want to be able to show people thinking through those things. I, I'm attracted to what I think of or I've heard called like protagonists of deduction, which includes things like like detectives or scientists or anybody working through some kind of intellectual problem or mystery, and the way we show them think. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that, that Chang does really well in his work. Uh, in an interview at Locus Magazine, he talked, uh, these two quotes that we're going to go through to start, talked first about what makes a story science fiction for him. And I, I really like uh, Chang's definition of science fiction, in which he says, I consider most of my work science fiction, even the stories that look like fantasy, which includes exhalation to me. Uh, Chang says, to me, what makes a story science fiction is not whether the universe has the same laws as our universe or not, but whether it is a universe in which the scientific method works. I think that's really interesting to me, that it's, it's fiction in which you can do science, because the scientific method, as we understand it, works in this space. Um, and then speaking about Exhalation specifically, Chang said, exhalation is about conceptual breakthrough, a way of describing scientific discovery and the experience of gaining a greater understanding of the universe. Recapturing the experience of conceptual breakthrough, dramatizing that is one of the things science fiction is good at. You can just as easily do that in a completely made up universe with a totally different set of physical laws. The underlying process is the same and I still think of it as scientific investigation. So I think this is really exciting to me that this is a, a way of thinking about what we're doing in fiction and that maybe this is something fiction is specifically good at. Um, I think like in movies, it can be really hard to show a person thinking, like the detective's just standing on screen and suddenly they're like, 
aha, right? It's just like a hard thing to show because we're not inside people, but fiction allows us to go inside people's minds in a certain way. Uh, so we're going to look at exhalation as an example of, um, excuse me, of this sort of uh, scientific investigation as process, scientific investigation as plot, and the way that works in this story. So for those of you who are not scientists, as I am not a scientist, and may need a reminder on what the scientific method is, this is sort of the, uh, the Wikipedia breakdown of the steps of the scientific method. Again, with a formulation of a question, what is the thing we're interested in the world? What is the thing that we're investigating? Uh, we come up with a hypothesis, a sort of educated guess of what might be happening, uh, a prediction for what we might discover once we start looking into it. We design an experiment in which we uh, test our prediction and our hypothesis, and then we analyze the results of that experiment. Um, so uh, in some ways, you can see this as the same kind of plot structure you might get from like excuse me, the three-act structure in film or Freytag's pyramid or these other ways of thinking about narrative that we can use the scientific method as a similar like skeleton upon which to hang a story. Um, so in Exhalation, uh, I think a lot of us have read it in preparation for this, but if you haven't, Exhalation is about a uh, robotic scientist who's investigating a series of problems in his world and the story begins um, with this paragraph. It has long been said that air, which others call argon, is the source of life. That it, this is not in fact the case, and I engrave these words to describe how I came to understand the true source of life, and as a corollary, the means by which life will one day end. For most of history, the proposition that we drew life from air was so obvious there was no need to assert it. Every day, we consume two lungs heavy with air. Every day, we remove the empty ones from our chest and replace them with full ones. Um, there's a lot of things I admire about this opening, including that parenthetical right at the beginning, right? It belongs to the air, which others call argon. That way it immediately puts us in sort of a different space, a different world, a different set of rules. Um, for most of history, the proposition we drew life from air was so obvious, nobody to assert it. Every day we consume two lungs heavy with air. Every day we remove the empty ones. The sort of difference is here right away. We're getting that, that different set, not a different set of physical laws, but a different way of being, a different way of sort of dwelling uh, in this world. Um, this seems really clear. I also think uh, you can feel that sort of like 19th century kind of naturalist writing here, right? It's sort of there's this uh, description of discovery or narrative of discovery that we recognize as a, as a sort of story form. We're being taught to, to read this as we go. Um, pretty quickly, we get into the, these two problems that are central to the story. The first one is related to these uh, criers that recite, the, recite this verse, a passage of verse every year. Uh, and I'll just read this paragraph as well to get the setup of that. At noon of the first day of every year, it is traditional for the crier to recite a passage of verse, an ode composed long ago for this annual celebration, which takes exactly one hour to deliver. The crier mentioned that on his most recent performance, the turret clock struck the hour before he had finished, something had never happened before. Another person remarked that this was a coincidence because he had just returned from a nearby district where the public crier had complained of the same incongruity. So we have this, this weird thing that's happening in this world, that suddenly this thing that always takes an hour is taking longer than an hour to accomplish. So that's sort of our first problem in the story. Uh, and then we have the second problem, which is how memory and thought works in this world. Uh, again, from the, our scientist protagonist. The field of anatomy still had a great unsolved mystery as core, the question of memory. The field of anatomy still, I'm sorry, that's, I'm just repeating it. Uh, while we knew a little about the structure of the brain, its physiology is notoriously hard to study because of the brain's extreme delicacy. It is typically the case in fatal accidents that when the skull is breached, the brain erupts in a cloud of gold, leaving little besides shredded filament and leaf from which nothing useful can be discerned. Um, so we have these two problems going together. One is creating like the urgency for the other, right? The problem of memory has been around in this world presumably for a long time. The problem of how these beings' brains work has been around. But now there's this, this thing that's happening in the world that creates sort of the incentive uh, to uh, investigate in the way that the scientist does. Um, so, going back to our scientific method, we now have this sort of formulation of a question. And to me, there are two questions at the heart of this story, of this scientist investigation. And one is, what is the cause of the clock anomaly? What is it that's causing this? And then, what is the nature of memory? So, these sort of two questions that we're going to proceed forward with. So far, so good? Yeah. All right, cool. Still sounds like science? This is sort of how it works? Good. <laughs> Every time I get something wrong about science, I'm looking at Maya and she's like, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have a formulation question. Now we start doing hypotheses. Um, 
so the first two hypotheses in the story go to the question of memory. Uh, the first is the prevailing theory. For decades, the prevailing theory of memory was that all of a person's experience were engraved on sheets of gold foil. So these beings have sheets of gold foil maybe in their heads. It was these sheets torn apart by the force of the blast that were the source of tiny flakes found after accidents. To so believe we have engraved memory is one hypothesis. And then other scientists believe uh, this competing school. I was a proponent of the competing School of thought, which held that our memories were stored in some medium in which the process of erasure was no more difficult than recording, perhaps in the rotation of gears or the positions of a series of switches. So these two ways, maybe their brains work. Don't really know how they did, how, you know, we still don't exactly know how our brains work, but once knew quite a bit less. Um, so then we're starting to make predictions. And uh, the first prediction, now we're going back to that first question, is maybe what is happening with the uh, uh, clock problems. So now we hear from a third public crier. Word arrived from a more distant district that its public crier had likewise observed the turret clock striking the hour before he had finished his New Year's recital. What made this notable was that his district clock employed a different mechanism, one in which the hours were marked by the flow of mercury into a bowl. Here the discrepancy could not be explained by a common mechanical fault. So the, the other clocks work the same way, this one works in a different way, so it's not, presumably not something wrong with the clocks. Most people suspected fraud, a practical joke perpetrated by mischief makers. I had a different suspicion, a darker one that I dared not voice, but decided my course of action. I would proceed with my experiment. Um, notably, for the purpose of like plot and suspense, Chang's character doesn't tell us what the second prediction is. He sort of holds it back, right? If you were doing actual science, maybe you would say out loud what you're doing, but he sort of keeps that close to the chest for, uh, for now. Um, so we get to experiment. He has to design an experiment in order to do this. He's thinking about how memory works, thinking about how cognition works, um, and tells us, I'd envision an experiment which might allow me to determine the truth conclusively, but it was a risky one and deserved careful consideration before it was undertaken. Uh, so starts telling us about the tools that he's making. The first tool I constructed was the simplest. In my laboratory, I fixed four prisms on mounting brackets and carefully aligned them so their apexes formed the corners of a rectangle. When arranged thus, a beam of light directed at one of the lower prisms was reflected up, then backward, then down, and then forward again in a quadrilateral loop. Accordingly, when I sat with my eyes at the level of the first prism, I obtained a clear view of the back of my own head. So in the conditions for the experiment, and then tells us, the very idea must sound like pure madness, I know. And I told any of my colleagues they would surely have tried to stop me. But I could not ask anyone else to risk themselves for the sake of anatomical inquiry. And because I wished to conduct the dissection myself, I would not be satisfied by merely being the passive subject of such an operation. Auto dissection was the only option. Um, I feel like auto dissection was the only option. It's just like a good sentence generally to put in a story. Um, even that, like, the very idea must sound like madness. If I told you my colleagues should try to stop me, it feels very like uh, Dr. Frankenstein, right? You feel that um, I'm doing something that sort of uh, we're not supposed to do in order to get to the core mysteries of the universe. Uh, a lot of the story is consumed with this experiment, right? We see uh, the character to start take his, his face or his head apart, takes the parts of his head uh, away so he can get closer to these gold leaves that are at the center of his brain. He's hooking them up to different air tanks and stuff so he can keep breathing. Um, I think it's like a bunch of the story is the, the logistics of that. Um, I think that's part of what makes the story work is the like the carefulness that Chang is sort of going through the experiment. They thought out this whole experiment. How would this really work in this world? What are the steps taking us through them one by one? Uh, because those mechanical steps are related to the thinking, right? If we don't have that delay, it's just like jump to cognition that doesn't feel real. So it's partly that process is how we make that happen. Um, as we know, as he starts uh, taking apart his head, we get to the point where there's all these little leaves that are flickering in the air, being moved by air pressure. And that's what he, he realizes, that the reason that people in the world who, who die some kind of accident or, or run out of air but are brought back to life don't remember themselves is because their memories are encoded in this constant sort of flow of air and the differential air pressure. So now we're into like the sort of analysis of the experiment that we've done. Uh, my consciousness could be said to be encoded in the position of these tiny leaves, but it would be more accurate to say that it was encoded in the ever-shifting pattern of air driving these leaves. Watching the oscillations of these flakes of gold, I saw that air does not, as we had always assumed, simply provide power to the engine that realized our thought. Air is, in fact, the very medium of our thoughts. All that we are is a pattern of airflow. My memories were inscribed not as grooves on foil or even the positions of switches, but as persistent currents of argon. So if we go all the way back to 
there's like two sort of predictions for what might be happening with memory in this world, we're now proving that it's the second one. He's, he's wrong about what the pattern is, but he's right that there's some kind of encoding pattern that's not like an engraved, written uh, thing inside their brain. Uh, and he goes on and starts, continues to sort of think how this works. In the moments after I grasped the nature of this lattice mechanism, a cascade of insights penetrated my consciousness in rapid succession. The goal of all study, a cascade of insights penetrated my consciousness in rapid succession. The first and most trivial was why gold, the most malleable and ductile of metals, was the only material out of which our brains could be made. Only the thinnest of foil leaves could move rapidly enough for such a mechanism. Only the most delicate of filaments could act as hinges for them. By comparison, the copper burr raised by my style as I engraved these words, it's a good little small world building detail, right? He's writing this copper burr as he's engraving. And brushed from the sheet when I finish each page is as coarse as heavy as scrap. This truly was a medium where erasing and recording could be performed rapidly, far more so than any arrangements of switches or gears. Um, I think part of the reason this is an exciting moment in the story is both because it's like it's wild, kind of cool invention, but also the thing he discovers is better than the thing he predicted. That feels like a really important part of these kind of things. Like uh, if at the end of it had been like a lesser version than he had predicted, it would not be a very interesting story, right? So it has to be more than uh, the works. Again, it was then, now we come back to the other problem. It was then that I perceived the solution to the clock anomaly. I saw that the speed of these leaves movement depended on their being supported by air. With sufficient airflow, the leaves could move nearly frictionlessly. If they were moving more slowly, it was because they were being subjected to more friction, which could occur only if the, sorry, which could occur only if the cushions of air that supported them were thinner and the air flowing through the lattice was moving with less force. I'll admit that I was a I was a terrible physics student in like high school. And every time I get to this part, I'm like, how does air pressure work again? But I assume Chang's right, and that this is more or less it. Um, and so we have this sort of analysis experiment. He set out a uh, prediction, designs experiment, uh, conducts it, and now we're analyzing it. Uh, and that could be the end of the story, right? If we just had this this thing that we we're curious about, and here's the answer to it in this sort of made-up world. But I think what really sort of sells the story, really makes it like feel sort of grand, is when we get to this moment of conceptual breakthrough, the greater understanding of the universe, that it's not that there are bigger stakes than just this thing about memory, although figuring out how the brain works is probably you know, a good start for a day, but there's this other bigger thing. Um, conceptual breakthrough, greater understanding of the universe. Now the character is getting into like, what this, the implications of this discovery are. This is why at the beginning of this engraving, I said that air is not the source of life. Air can be neither created nor destroyed. The total amount of air in the universe remains constant, and if air were all that we needed to live, we would never die. But in truth, the source of life is a difference in air pressure, again in this world. The flow of air from spaces where it's thick to those where it's thin. The activity of our brains, the motion of our bodies, the action of every machine we've ever built is driven by the movement of air, the force exerted as differing pressures seek to balance each other out. When the pressure everywhere in the universe is the same, all the air will be motionless and useless. One day, we will be surrounded by motionless air and unable to derive any benefit from it. This is a very cheery scientist. Uh, we are not really consuming air at all. The amount of air that I draw from each day's new pair of lungs is exactly as much as seeps out through the joints of my limbs and the seams of my casing, exactly as much as I'm adding to the atmosphere around me, all I'm is doing is converting air at high, pressure to, at high pressure to air at low. With every movement of my body, I contribute to the equalization of pressure in our universe. With every thought I have, I hasten the arrival of that fatal equilibrium. Um, yeah, which is a daunting thought. <laughs> and, you know, of course, one of the interesting things that goes on in the story is this record is being prepared not only to explain, not really to explain to things to people in his own world, who he's already explained them to, but to explain people who might come from another world and discover it. Uh, maybe that's another, like, real fictional joy here, that feeling of, like, reading a document from another world, another time, that we, get, we derive a lot of joy from. Um, and, and of course, you know, I think in the same maybe interview I quoted before, Chang talks about like even though this is really different, it's also still uh, related to like physics in our own world. Like I, I think his very cheery conclusion is like one day heat death is coming for us all, um, which is also true, I suppose. Uh, will be you know, <laughs> uh, there's a version of the Big Bang in this story. Like there's the uh, an exhalation that starts the world right in the way that we think of our world as being started by this explosion of energy. There's a started by like the first first exhalation that they're sort of playing out. Um, but I think this is really uh, a really attractive way to sort of build a story. And I'll just say, um, 
you know, we, we talk a lot at, at ASU, especially about uh, how things in the humanities and how things in, in creative writing and other spaces have sort of like public facing uh, benefit or, or what we're doing for the public. But I think a story like this is a really good example of showing how problems are approached and solved and lead to bigger understandings, partly because we live in a time where many of our problems feel like impossible to solve or sort of too daunting to solve or even to approach and to remember that we have these sort of frameworks for approaching really complex problems and that there are ways to sort of see them through is actually like, uh, for me, a really hopeful gesture, even though again, this story ends with like the air death of the universe and like our, you know, and the memory of our own impending billions of years from now heat death. Um, I still think it's actually a really hopeful story that it's, it is about um, both like the solutions in the world of the story and the solutions we can enact in our own world or modes of inquiry in the own, our own world. And also that sort of ending note the story of like, even when this world ends, there's like another world after it. Like there's always something that comes after and that by itself is, is sort of hopeful to me. Um, that's most of what I have to say about this way of reading it as, a, as a, a scientific method as a sort of story shape. And I would just say like for people who are interested in doing this kind of work, um, I think sometimes Ted Chang's work feels really hard to, to sort of emulate. He feels like a really like specific kind of writer to me in our, our current time. Not a lot of other people are doing exactly what he does. But I think going back and thinking about this sort of story shape as opposed to other story shapes that we are used to might be a way of like getting into his kind of thinking. Um, one of my other favorite Ted Chang stories is the story uh, Tower of Babel. Where, yeah, which is just it's such a great story. And I think for, for many of us, it was the first Ted Chang story we read. Um, and he's approaching like the building of the historical Tower of Babel in this very mechanistic, realistic architecture sort of way. I'm um, just trying to solve the problems of building a tower from earth to heaven. Um, it's just really attractive like mode of thinking to be in that world with it. Um, and I think that story actually could probably, a similar thing could be applied there. It might be more of a history of it, but I think there's a similar kind of problem solving at work. Um, Okay, I think I should stop talking for a minute, and I'm happy to take uh, questions, conversation, uh, either about this specific way of thinking about exhalation or other things that you noticed or were moved by or interested in in the story. Um, even though he disproved the concept, the initial idea of <coughs> memories being engraved on gold leaf, yeah. I just thought it was a really beautiful idea of like these delicate sheets of gold in our brains. Um, having so easily torn apart. Um, but I also like that I have, this is the only story I've read cool. by him. Um, but what I also really liked was how physical mm. the science was in this, that you could hear the gears, you know, as he's like opening his own brain and, and as he's, he's engraving it on the copper and that kind of stuff. And um, I'm curious how, if, he, if that's kind of a style of his, is to have a little bit of a, not steampunk, but like an older feel to the science and, and if that kind of changes the story. Yeah, I think it probably, I'll just repeat some of that question for people on Zoom. Uh, thank you so much, Penny. Uh, Penny, first, like admiring sort of the, the image of the gold leaf moving in the air of the brain, which is, I think, really attractive, and I agree as part of it. But then also this question about like the concreteness or the physicality of the experiment, of the thing being studied. Uh, I think you're right that that's part of the pleasure here, that um, it is like physical science. You can see it and see it being done. And I would say that seems broadly true of a lot of Ted Chang stories. Probably other people can remind me of other things. There's some that feel more like the kind of science we do now, but um, that feels very conceptual to people. That's hard to see and hard to understand. But I think there is something about, as maybe in all fiction, making it concrete, making it physical, making it like actions people are taking with their bodies. Um, fiction, paradoxically, is like a really visual medium, right? We have to be able to picture people doing things. There's that image in this story of, uh, of the scientist's brain or, or skull kind of taken apart and like floating around him. And I just think that, that that's so attractive. And uh, actually would not, it'd be harder to get that same kind of wonder about the brain from like a human dissection, right? You know, it's actually, that's part of what makes it work. Uh, but all those hydraulics and the tubes and the air pumps and all that stuff is like, I think part of why the story is attractive in that way. Certainly the Tower of Babel works that way, right? It's like people are like doing masonry, right? It's sort of a task. Um, and, but I think even in something like uh, story, of a story of My Life, Story of My Life, Story of Your Life, that became uh, a rival, um, the linguistics in that is approached in a very like, physical way. People are like, making like, drawings of the alien language and presenting them, and they're in the story in that way, they're in the movie that way. I think it's always that you have to find a way to make the concept visual. Um, I don't know if this is useful, but I was thinking, I always think about, 
uh, like the theory of relativity, which is a thing I do not understand. So we're talking about for like eight seconds. But my dad was a physics person, a computer engineer, um, and he loved that stuff. And he talked to me about the twin paradox, you know, where one person moves at the speed of light and one doesn't, and you come back different ages, or the like bowling ball in the bed sheet where like gravity bends like space time. And those, I think everybody who gets taught that stuff learns those same two like ways of visualizing it. Because without those, it's just really, really hard to think about it. So some of what we're doing, or scientists are always doing, is like looking for like the right metaphor, the right physical thing that makes the concept understandable. So yeah, I, I agree. Like that seems deeply central to why this story works. Yeah, yeah Jeffrey. So can you help me to articulate this better because it, I think one of the things I like about his stories are they offer you a vision of a total system yeah. but they don't give you enough to close that system. Yeah. So one of the things that I kept thinking about in your presentation is it starts out, his world starts out with a, um, a balance between is memory engraved or is it processed? Right. Except the only way you get the story is through it's engraved. Right, it's right. engraved on copper, and that's the memory that enables the story. Mm. But then there's no return to that, right? There's only the declaration, no, it's all process, and once the process stops, the memory's gone, except it's not. Right. And that's why we get the gift of the story. So it'd be interesting, for example, like if he had named the story engravement rather right. than exhalation, because it feels like those are the two tensions there, with one's about history, writing, and remembrance, but so is the other. Yeah. And they're just two systems that, I, and I don't know, it feels like it's not one or the other, and the total system didn't quite work. Uh-huh. I, I have to say, but I can see you were ready to go, so I'm going to bring you in instead, yeah? <laughs> yeah, back. I'm very interested in that, too. Oh, this is beautiful. I love this. Uh, but sort of the end there as well, sort of that uh, ability to share a moment, and so I think sort of what might be gestured towards is this idea that even though the memory of theirs is nothing but air, something that disappears, the writing is more permanent, it goes into our process of memory. Yeah. And so it could be an exhalation of our own in that way. Uh, that, in other words, we're breathing out this new story that we're receiving in the same way. And so I think it sort of tries to combine it at the end. Um, and I love to mention the closed system because it does talk about the second laws of thermodynamics. The systems have to be that way. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, ah, I love those. That's yeah. cute. <laughs> <laughs> And just for people on Zoom, I'll repeat a, a, just a little bit of that, which is uh, Jeffrey was talking about the tension between the sort of memory as air movement and then the engravement of the story. Um, and, uh, and I think that is really interesting, and I, and I love the way you're thinking about it as well. Um, I mean, it's one of the things we all like about writing, right? It's a way of making thought or memory permanent and transferable and transferable time. Uh, me and Jeffrey and, and Ron were reading the Iliad over Christmas break, which is, you know, you're reading a 2,000-year-old exhalation, right? You know, it's, it's sort of amazing that that's possible. Um, and that seems is really interesting. Um, I think that might be something that uh, that Chang is interested in other ways too. Ron was mentioning his AI writing. He's been writing some really great essays for The New Yorker and and uh, The Atlantic and other places about sort of the way, not, he, he would immediately say none of it's AI, but the way large language models work, which is a different thing. And one of them is about the hallucinations of large language models. Uh, and he's really concerned about compression that the way we use compression to save data in, in you know, music or in images or media, all those things. But part of that works is when you uncompress, you fill in the missing bits with what's likely there. And that sort of work, I mean, it might not work in a picture or a video too, but it, like in language, it's much harder to know what like the next word is or the next thing is going to be or the next part of a poem or the next part of the Iliad or like, you know, so that, that kind of, we could have all of human, text all of human thought, our whole engravement on like a thumb drive or something, if we just compress it enough, it's, it's to him like a disastrous idea that's actually keeping it at scale. And the only, you know, it seems really interesting to me. Um, and I guess that sort of dovetails one of my own beliefs sort of about fiction, uh, maybe especially, is like most books are reduced by summary. You know, it's only the experience of actually reading the book that is the book. And so that sort of making everything digestible is, is actually just kind of stopping it from being the thing it is. Um, maybe that's a long way around from your question, Jeffrey. But I think it's all in the, my mix of what I'm thinking about in the same way. Um, yeah. And I, I think part of the pleasure of this story, even though it's, uh, t you know, last 10 years, probably from when it first came out, um, is that, uh, that feeling of having like an ancient text that you're like in contact with, even though it's not quite that. Yeah, I was wondering about this, about there's almost a, it's not a fairy tale, mm -hmm. but it has a quality where the characters seem almost dreamlike or yeah. strange in that way. 
So it's not a psychological development of characters, right. it's intellectual development. Yeah. So I was wondering if you talked a little bit about that method or how he's making that happen. Yeah, uh, Ron's question for there's in Zoom is about uh, maybe that the story is not a psychological change in a character, although there obviously the thought change, but we're not, we don't get to know this person as a character. We have no idea what their like home life is or something, right? It's like, we're not interested in that. It's not the reason we're reading. Um, you mentioned it seeming like a fairy tale. That makes me think of uh, one of the, the qualities of fairy tales is what Kate Bernheimer calls flatness, and that just like characters do not have psychological depth, and that's actually part of how they work. Um, and Bernheimer sort of argues that, you know, like you read like a uh, traditional telling of like Little Red Riding Hood and you're not like learning about Little Red Riding Hood, like childhood trauma that makes sure this is an adult or something, right? The psychology doesn't exist in that way. And she's like, paradoxically, you know, we're taught to make round characters, but that flat characters, when employed right, become like containers and the reader fills them. And so like, it, because this robotic scientist doesn't have psychological depth, you fill some of that in with yourself you kind of put yourself in that place. You imagine yourself as a scientist or you imagine yourself making these discoveries. Um, it's actually a way of like drawing you in, even though we're sort of told the only way to draw you in is to give you this like character you can empathize with in a certain way. So I, I, I mean, I sort of agree. I think this character is very flat and that is the purpose of them as opposed to like any kind of flaw in it. Yeah, I know you weren't saying yeah, it's a flaw, yeah. but yeah. A lot of these characters have that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's probably true of a lot of kinds of narratives like that. Like it, it is the, like reading, something about this also makes me feel, maybe that's that 19th century naturalist thing I'm feeling like age of exploration narratives, or I just you know, read like a Shackleton biography this year and like a, a journal from Shackleton feels this way, right? Like I did this and I did this and I did this and we solved the problem, we solved the problem, we solved the problem. But you're not getting to know Shackleton, right? <laughs> like, that's not the purpose of reading that. It's actually to imagine yourself on the ice, right? Um, so I think, yeah, it makes total sense that that's part of the effect here. If I could add, I think yeah. you know, the fairy tale quality of it, sort of this uh, weirdness of it to it, is like the idea and concept of death and ends. And so there is a bit of a mixed one at the beginning that sometimes they die, but it's not an often thing that happens yeah. you know, for centuries or whatever. And just like their brains can hold all that information for that long time. We don't know why, it just happens, don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, and then we only get like a few instances of death where it's been catastrophic and accident still, and then we get to learn that they learn now too, there is an end, there is this finite moment and so now it almost seems to give meaning to what they're trying to do, meaning to the narrative we're following. That since they're people, his, he has an end too. Yeah. We must think about like what's the importance of sharing something else after that. It almost seems like he comes to that realization too, how important it is to uh, share something else. That, I mean, think at the beginning of this story, they're talking about sharing your lungs. Yeah. It's like a communal, uh, communal, almost like a dinner time process. Mm. This is so cute. What a nice little addition. Yeah. <laughs> they humanize them in a sort of way to make us feel familiar, almost like sharing uh, the lungs that you refill for others, like sharing the gossip, um, having a good time together. So it brings us back to a communal feeling, too. Yeah, I love that. I, you know, I never thought of that connection. Uh from that to like the end, right? The way that these communal sharings of, of stories while you're filling up your lungs and helping other people fill their lungs is of course what this engraving is doing with us too, right? It's this sort of like, you know, my last breath to your current breath kind of uh, thing. I think that feels really right. Um, yeah, and uh, one of the things you're always trying to make in a story is uh, like urgency. Like why, it's the like why today question in fiction. Like why are we reading this story and why is the character telling it? Um, and it is that like, recognition of the, their mortality and their world's mortality that was the re occasion for story, right? That um, in the world where no one dies and life will go on like this forever, like there's not, there's no urgency to communicate this to someone. The reason to write this engraving is so that it'll outlast whatever that last exhalation in this world is, um, which feels really good. You know, I think there's a, a corollary thing happening right now in a lot of like nature writing and climate writing, um, not to be too like, you know, grim at lunchtime, but uh, you know, thinking of all the things in the natural world that are, are changing or passing because of, of the advance of climate change. And that one of the, the modes of a lot of nature writing right now is really kind of like elegy or preservation, like to preserve the experience of living in this version of our world in text is a reason to write. Um, and, uh, and I've seen that tension in a lot of like recent climate fiction, you know, where uh, like children growing up 100 years from now don't miss the things we would miss if we made it to 100 years from now. Um, there's a, a great scene in Sarah Blake's uh, story, I think it's called Clean Air, or novel, where the, uh, like all the animals on earth have, have mostly died due to this like pollen thing. Um, but uh, but the, like the kids don't, aren't like sad that there aren't 
animals because they didn't know animals. And the parents are like devastated that like there are no birds to show their kids and no pets to have and things like that. So I think that that feeling of like, I want to preserve the world as it is and, and communicate it seems very uh, human or argon breathing robot is what the case might be. Yeah. Yeah, Maya, please. Yeah. I, I was familiar with that quote and I always thought it was kind of like it didn't really make sense to me because I thought like well you can't just jump into the world of a story and try to do the scientific method right. <laughs> because like in our world the scientific method is useful because things happen as a result of phenomena that we can observe and try to understand but in a story they happen because the author decides they would happen right. uh, everything in the story happens because of that um, so how do you like see that, that tension between, I guess, like writing about the scientific method while also there are no, um, that doesn't exist in the world of a story because right. everything, in, in the same way that, that characters in a story don't necessarily have psychological yeah. um, depth, things don't happen in a story as a result of natural phenomenon. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so Maya was asking how, like, how we get to the place where we use the scientific method because you don't necessarily have to make a world where the the world works that way. I, I have no idea how Chang writes this this kind of story or where he starts. My my feeling is like he's either discovering those rules as he's going, or by, I bet for a story like this, he had to agree on them in advance in some ways. He had to come up with the world and then apply the scientific method to it, which seems like the way I could see doing that. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know what your experience is as a fiction writer. Like I'm always discovering things in the world, and then you have to live with the things you put in there. And I wonder if that's a little bit of it. It's like a little like. Uh, like you get to be God first and then you have to be a scientist, right? You know, like you get to do both things in the same world. Um, uh, a Swedish fabulous writer named Karen Tidbeck I like a lot um, once uh, uh, said in an interview, um, world building is just taking the consequences of all of your ideas. And I think that seems like part of this, like, right, once you make up a world in which people breathe argon and their, their brains work in this way, and then it's like, what are the consequences of that world? How would that world work? That can be part of it. Um, if you designed a science fiction story where a planet is like closer to the sun than ours is, then you have to think about what life would be like in a place like that. And that's just taking the consequences of your world building. Um, you obviously can write a, a world in which the scientific method would not work, but I think that the sort of taking seriously the physical consequences of world building will usually, I think, leave you in a place where it does. Um, when, I, when I teach like fantasy writing in my world building class, we talk a lot about like magic, whether it's like rule based or sort of just a little like, ooh, magic works here. You know, like, like the magic in the Lord of the Rings, I don't think the scientific method is going to like work on, right? It's just, it's sort of like, it's, I mean, I think it's mostly like religious, right? So it's sort of a different thing. But like the magic in something like N.K. Jemison's The Fifth Season feels like you could maybe apply the scientific method to that. Like it's based out of like um, uh, geology and uh, Seismology, study of earthquakes, right? You know, there's sort of uh, tectonics. There's like a, enough scientific background that you could imagine studying in that world. And of course, that world actually has scientists in it um, that are not called scientists, but they're scientists, right? Um, and so I think maybe that's part of it. I don't know if I answered your question. I think those are sort of, I'm thinking in my own work sometimes that tension between a world that has sort of discoverable worlds, rules, even if the characters never discover them, and then something that is more fairy tale or myth-like, where it, it works, um, again, going back to like Kate Bernheimer, she calls it intuitive logic, right? It's not like logical cause and effect. The next thing happens because it feels like the right next thing to happen. Uh, sort of a different way of moving through story. Yeah. That's great, it's tough. Yeah, please, Penny. So, the science feel of it is, there's two words in the story that do a lot of work. Argon, yeah. Mm -hmm. All at the edge of the world, and just the choice of those words tells you a lot. Even though the wall is not explained, we don't, are they in a giant metal box? We don't right. know. Right. You know. Yeah. But having those two words does so much world building, but we still understand those words because they're from our universe as well. You know, and so it's like it, yeah. it, it sets the scene of. This is, it gives it more of that science feel. Yeah, it's so much more. Uh, so Penny was saying that uh, that argon and chromium do a lot of that work of making it feel grounded in scientists. I think that's sort of right. Um, that if they were made up metals or made up gases, they wouldn't do that work. Or if they were just left out, like it's we breathe air and there's a metal shell around the world, would not right. would not function away. Yeah, I mean it's that same thing. Like specificity is like that sort of lifeblood of fiction in that way. Um, I think that's right. 
Uh, and I think there's something about a lot of the philosophical problems they have in this world are our philosophical problems too. They're just stated differently. You sort of recognize them, like right? Is there another world beyond this world? Is sort of you know a, a old human thought as well, and so that works in that way. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. It's that grounding in it. I really think that first parenthetical at the beginning that's just like. Uh, as long as said the air, which others call the argon, is the source of life, that parenthetical does so much work for sort of setting us up and teaching us how to read this story. But I, I think you're absolutely right that it being sort of a real gas helps. If it was like, which others call unobtainium or something, would not, it would just wouldn't do the same thing, right? It would, it would have a very different feel. Yeah. I, I never noticed really until I get to the end he talks about engraving, but that engrave does a lot of that too, right? It's an engraving. As, I, I, I write these words would be very different. Um, the way they write on you know, metal is the way they imagine their brains work in the same way that writing is sometimes a metaphor for how we think our brains work, although they do not work the way writing does, right? It feels very, um, yeah, corollary in that way. It's really nice. Yeah, yeah it was weird too when he hits that wall. Uh, talks about this world. All of a sudden, scale changes. Mm, like, mm -hmm. How big is this world? Is it like really tiny? Uh, but to them, big, and, or is it really huge? Right. And then you think of the Babylon story, uh, which, you know, they come up against the same kinds of problems. And then all of a sudden, you get to these questions of teleology, which are very religious questions. Yeah. Questions of meaning and like where are we going, yeah. um, which is are both story questions and theological questions. And it's interesting how he uses science and theology in the same collection. Yeah, there's a deep want at the end of the story from the narrator, I think, for life to have like spiritual meaning or to be more than that. Where um, this, um, I think we keep saying he, but I don't think there's really any evidence that's a he, right? This person. Uh, uh, is thinking like, I hope that people who come in from the outside aren't just looking for like an air differential, right? He, the, just more physical reality is not the goal. Like he really wants it to be like meaningful that they lived and meaningful that they did these things and discovered these things. And that uh, of course also feels very human and, and spiritual in that way. Um, I think, yeah, I think Chang often gestures sort of at that, like the spiritual, the larger meaning of things, that the stories are very scientific, but they're not, um, at least it means I have no idea what, what Chang's own sort of spiritual beliefs are or aren't, but like the stories don't feel like strictly deterministically like atheist to me, right? There's often this sense of like bigger meaning, whatever that is, um, seems really uh, important to like the end of a lot of his stories. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating to me that there was some level of hope. Yeah. You know, like if, if it helps to understand all this, this is great. I'm, you know, why are we here? Yeah. Even if the fact that we're here because some other civilization is going to come along and yeah. suck out what, I don't think he used the word, so. <laughs> <laughs> kind of vacuum out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our world, that they need to live. Yeah. Right? So our death, according to um, this person who's ungendered. Yes. Is life for the Absolutely. civilization. Yeah. And even for that civilization, some other group is going to come along. Yeah. So there's this hope, this robot, kind of like us, that there is an eternity. Yeah. Like, you know, it's not just going to end with me yeah. or with, with us. Because I did think that the whole wall piece, and apparently there was uh, a top. Yeah, there. yeah, there's an un there's unknown so but there. must be their top, right? Yeah. And eventually the air is going to run out. Yeah. You know, we don't know when, but it will yeah. run out. But even when it runs out, it's going to be used to support some other civilization. So I was really struck by the hope. And I'll, the one last point I'll yeah, make uh, about his writing is that he, he deliberately, in my view, yeah. right, um, creates a situation where we don't know. And as you said earlier, we have to fill these things. Yeah. We don't know where that first breath Came from. Right. Like when you think about the Big Bang Theory, you know, it was a little dot and then boom. Okay, but well, we're the little dot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so many other things that right. we don't know about. And I feel like that not knowing holds the story together because I, I like you, yeah, I've never read anything um, that he'd written before, but I always liked science fiction yeah. as a kid and a hmm. young adult too. And I had all these questions for you. Yeah. Um, but the not knowing feels kind of comfortable. I think it's necessary, right? What if that? How come he didn't? 
and so on and so forth, just kind of fills it in. Because it, it partly it asks you to formulate questions and to think about how you can figure them out and to think through them yourself, which seems like part of the joy of, of reading, of all stories. Um, I think, you know, especially writing things that are, are noveling for me, uh, I often, you know, kind of launch the writing with like not really knowing what I'm doing. And so there's a lot of it's like the mystery for me and I'm kind of exploring. And there's always a point toward the end of a novel draft um, this happens in stories too, but certainly at, at larger scale, it feels even more dramatic where like you're answering all the questions and the mystery is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's kind of like a tragedy, right? We're in this like, you know, and I'm always looking for how like the mystery can be like reopened or a new mystery can replace it. Um, I uh, uh, was, you know, raised uh, like very devout Catholic, you know, when I was talking about like the mysteries of the faith and like the more you studied, the, the bigger the mysteries got. And I really like that feeling in fiction as well. Like, that, like a, a, a book whose system resolves itself is less interesting than the one that like the more you learn about the world, the story, the bigger the mystery gets. Um, now there's obviously a way to do that that's not satisfying, but like you have, to, you have to resolve things for the reader, but you resolve them in such a way that like the next layer of mystery becomes apparent. And I think this story ends that way, right? It's like the world beyond this world, the world, other worlds, the world you're from reading this. And I think like that, uh, that expansive feeling at the end is r so much better to me than the like, cool, got it all, figured it out, uh, which is just actually not that interesting to me. Yeah, please. Part of what helps develop that expansive feeling, uh, to like peek on uh, to, like, the religious quality of this as well, is that we have uh, the robot here recognizing, like, when they're taking apart their brain, yeah. it's like there must be some sort of divine creator to make this. Yeah. Like, possibly with the robots too, it would be easier for us to see that connection parallel. We can think about our own world that way too, in that um, we can imagine this being constructed, whereas, like, our own brains being imagined more as either evolving or changing in some way. Uh, but it doesn't seem like quite possible for these robots that uh, they evolved. But maybe right. they did. Maybe it's a future robot thing. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> the last robot builds the next robot kind of thing, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I mean, this is exactly that speculation that's so fun, right? Like, is this a, is, this could be a world designed by people like us, right? That you've, you set robots going inside this kind of thing. Like, they have no idea, right? Um, but it seems really uh, attractive to speculate, or a lot of the fun of this is that kind of thinking. I mean, it's one of the reasons why it's a fun story to discuss. Like, if it was really easy, I'd just be like, so this is what happens in the story, so we're done. And like, there would be no reason to have a conversation, you know? But yeah, I think that's absolutely, please. So can you explain some more of what you mean by world building? Is that, and how that differs from just fiction? Sure, and I mean, it doesn't necessarily differ from fiction, but I really just mean, uh, world building can mean a lot of things, but, uh, you know, it, for me, it's like all the things that go into making the world feel sort of fleshed out and real. Um, so if you're inventing like a wholly new world, it might be what are the, what's the biome like? What's the, what's the climate like? What are governments and economies like? How does technology work? What do people wear? How do they, what kind of how, homes do they live in? How do they dwell? Um, so all the things that sort of make a, a sort of uh, a world that, that is invented. Um, in some of the set on Earth, it may just be like what happens when you add a new kind of technology or what happens in, you know, if you change something about history. Uh, but it's really that um, trying to make the world feel like sort of real and lived in um, so that it feels realistic, even if it's entirely invented. Um, a friend of mine, Lincoln Michelle, uses another term that I really like, which he calls world conjuring, uh, which, he, which means basically the same thing, but he means that instead of like filling it all in for the reader, you suggest enough that the reader does the rest of the filling. And I think that even though this story is like really scientific, uh, I think it's still like a, a world conjuring story, right? There's a lot we're not explained. Even like, what is this poem they're all reading? What are they doing on these things? Like, there's like a lot of things we're just left to imagine for ourselves. So it's like enough invented verisimilitude that the reader accepts the world. But it doesn't have to be like everything is sort of known. Um, of course, yeah. But when you start from like, well, you know, it's funny because on one hand, I'm always like, when you start from the real world, you don't have to do as big of a lift, right? Um, you say like, this story is set in New York City and we sort of know that New York City exists and works. Uh, although I always think like, when I was 13, I knew a lot more about like Middle Earth than I did New York City, right? You know, like I would, I would need like a, an atlas of New York City, but I could like tell you about Middle Earth. So like, it's a little bit what worlds live inside us already. Um, but certainly if you're doing historical work, you obviously do similar world building. You're sort of, how did people live in that time? You're trying to make it feel real. Um, when we talk about it, at, you know, Ron mentioned I run this thing here called the World Building Initiative. Uh, there we're talking about using those kind of like invented tools, which for me are always about like, how could we live different? Can we imagine other ways of being or other ways of doing things? And then we're trying to use those in the, oh, just to highlight that in our own world, like the way things are is not the only way they have to be. And I think that's also some of the joy of reading like science fiction and fantasy different ways or reading outside your own culture, of course. <laughs>
I don't know if I'm the only one, but I, when I read this, story, yeah. I, I don't read much. That's that great. Question, so I don't have any very much familiarity with uh, Johnny. But to me, he's really talking about the current world. And yeah. He, and he's really trying to metamorphize the current situation and how we, uh, climate change is you know, taking up all the air. Yeah. And, uh, of polluting the air. And so I kept thinking that, you know, a lot of the metaphors that he used in, in, the, in the story are ways to sort of concretize what are the problems that we're facing today. So I was yeah. trying to get a feel for when you're using world building, is it just, are you, anticip are you anticipating that the worlds that are go going to be built are in the future? Right. Uh, that's, I, I love the way you're describing that. I think that's really great. Um, again, for those people on Zoom, we're just talking about uh, that exhalation feels like it's describing our own world and our own sort of experience with climate change and, and the sort of maybe doom uh, part of that. Um, I, would, I think that's totally right. Uh, Ursula Gwynn has a great essay which talks about everybody thinks science fiction predict is predictive, but science fiction isn't predictive. It's always like looking at our own world. There's a way of, of talking about the present, which I think seems exactly right. Um, I mean, every book, to some extent, has to be about the life the author is actually living, right? Like, you don't know about any other lives. Um, so that makes sense to me. Uh, I think for me, one of the reasons sometimes to do it in like science fiction, the way that this story does it, is just defamiliarization. There's just, just by putting it in another space, sometimes it makes it easier to see. Uh, you think about how like polarized we are sort of in our, our society. And if you say like, let's talk about like the emotional experience of climate change. Like even people agree with you might not want to have that conversation, right? Just because it seems kind of grim or depressing or you know, of course other people just be like, climate change isn't real or whatever. But you can read a story like this and it's totally, you're right, totally seems to me about the experience of like discovering climate change or something like that, some other kind of uh, uh, existential threat. Um, but because it does it in this other space, your guard goes down or you're able to see it differently. Um, I mentioned thinking of stories as models of reality. Like this model gives you a place to think through this kind of thinking that's easier than let's think about climate change, which is just like such a big multifaceted, multifarious thing that's very hard to think about. So sometimes I think these kind of stories give us a smaller, like safer playing field. And that can be like a really useful sort of thing. Um, but I think it's doing exactly the work you're talking about. Well, also in terms of the, the description of memory, yeah. So it's my understanding, and I'm certainly not an expert on neuroscience. Same. That if we remember things, we are actually reconstituting the memory. Right? Yeah. So when he's talking about memories not being engraved, but being part of the flow, yeah. that is what I is resonant with what I understand the neuroscience to be. That yeah. we actually, and when we re remember events that happened in the past, we change the memory. Absolutely. We either make them stronger or weaker or change some details. But I think everybody has the experience when they are sure that they remember something a certain way and then they get evidence that, no, this may not exactly. Yeah. The horror of having siblings, right? You know, like, yeah. <laughs> um, having siblings, right? Where you're like, this is a childhood's like, and they're like, no, it wasn't. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I think that's right. Uh, making me think of uh, William Gass talked about uh, this essay called Fiction and the Figures of Life. He talks about metaphor and simile work. And he's like, a, a great metaphor describes both ways, right? So that the thing the metaphor is about is described by and, and vice versa. And I think this seems like a good example of that, right? Like the way memory works in here is obviously inspired by our real memory, but also goes back at it. And like reading this description of memory makes clearer how ours is not an engraving as well. That like to think of your memories as like air passing through you is, is not totally wrong, right? You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That might help with like some of the conceptualization of that. I just want to make you a scholar say um, it let's talk about world building and world coherence. Mm. The idea that we can like make these worlds which usually talks like social situations. Yeah. Like Yeah. 
that's the same thing in thinking of the and in two is that there's an expectation that we'll make out of if we decipher these words it meaningful to us in some right. way. Yeah. And to me it just hangs in the air. Like, will we ever be able to decipher those things? And I'm thinking of story of your life, that sort of thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I love that. No, thank you. That I love that description. And uh, to add that term for people on Zoom, like world cohering is a, how do we make sense of the world? I like there's like a like a build conjure cohere like task list here. That that seems really like an interesting way to think about what we're up to when we're writing these kind of stories. Yeah, absolutely. We're closing in on, on certain time. Um, does anybody have like a final thought or question or, or something we haven't talked about? I think ending with Bill Conjure here. Yeah, yeah, I'm you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, please join me in uh, thanking Matt. Thank you all. Thank you. And the lesson is to go build conjure.